In trying to understand what makes us human, we ask some fairly fundamental questions about human nature. To do this scientifically, we want to ask if any of these traits that make us human might have a genetic basis. We want to do this in contemplating the origins of the large-scale societies that now dominate the Earth. Historically, we can reconstruct something about our ancestry by looking at the genetics of all human groupings. These connect through the DNA similarities of people from India, Asia, East Africa, West Africa, etc. And we see common ancestry that takes us back to Africa. Closest to the common ancestor of all humans is found in Africa. And particularly over here on the far right, are the pygmies and the bushmen. These are people that still live a lifestyle that would have typified our ancestors for tens of thousands of years. These are the bushmen of South Africa and the pygmies. We therefore think that our common ancestor would have had this kind of social system. Typical of the bushmen, the Khoisan of Namibia, who have small bands that roam around together looking for food. This is always see, also seen. This is also seen in the Sundawe people of East Africa and Tanzania, and even in the pygmies that are found in the rainforests in the Congo. Human societies have certain typical patterns. The earliest would have been these hunter-gatherers, groups of maybe 30 to 50 people that stayed together, that moved around together. Even in North America, we see this with the Native Americans moving up and down the plains, looking for resources through the seasons. At some point, about 10,000 years ago, humans domesticated livestock and they became pastless. So instead of relying on wild prey, they kept their own. A profound transformation took place with the origins of agriculture about 6,000 years ago. For the first time, people could stay put year after year. And it's after this that we see the origins of first the city-states, typified by Greece, Rome, back thousands of years ago and more recently, the nation-states, identified by a large group of people over a geographical area. Looking at the evolution of human society, we want to ask, could society itself be an adaptation, as we saw earlier in the lions? Is human society really the product of natural selection? And if we're going to be doing this, we should probably want to be confident that any human behavior shows a genetic basis. So let's look at some uniquely human behaviors and ask how genetic they might be. To do this, we want to look for human universals, that is, something that's found all over the world, regardless of culture. And we want to try to control for these cultural factors or the environment. And then we're going to test for patterns of inheritance. After these traits are identified, then we might want to be able to ask whether these confer some sort of evolutionary or selective advantage. First, how do you measure heritability? To measure heritability, you want to take certain groups of relatives to see how similar they are. And the most similar you can be is if you happen to have an identical twin. These are monozygotic twins. They're genetically identical. Fraternal twins are two different eggs, two different sperm. They're no more closely related than any other two siblings but at least they shared the same uterine environment and they were born at exactly the same time. So they would have a very, very similar environment. Now ideally, we want to control for the environment by taking these twins who have somehow been separated at birth and then reared apart. They would then have a common genetic inheritance but a very different environmental experience. And then if we still see extraordinary similarities, and especially those that are exceptionally high for identical twins, we can say that must be due to genetics. And that proportion of similarity due to genetics we call heritability. Now in thinking about behaviors, we assume that these originate inside our brains. So first let's just look and see how similar brains are of fraternal versus identical twins. Here we have on the left maps of the similarity of brains the frontal cortex or the sensory motor cortex of identical twins versus fraternal twins. And we can see that the mass of gray matter is extraordinarily similar in identical twins. They have almost the exact same brains in inside those skulls, whereas these are similar too, but not nearly as similar as that of identical twins. So we know that the very substrate 
of our behavior. Our brain has a very, very high heritability. Now, heritability is something that's really actually an abstraction. And I can't say, and no one can say, whether your behavior is due to your genes. But we can say that people who have your genes might, on average, behave in a certain way with a certain probability. So we measure heritability in populations rather than specific individuals. And to conceptualize this, let's say that we can measure the traits of parents and then their offspring, and we find that the offspring are genetically exactly the same, or rather behaviorally exactly the same as their parents, and so they would have perfect heritability. So that would be if, they, for example, height was perfectly determined by genetics, offspring would be exactly the same height as their parents. If there's no heritability, any two parents would have children of any height. So there'd be no correlation between height of parents and offspring. Now, most traits are somewhere in the middle, and they show a partial heritability. So this term, h squared, which is our algebraic representation for heritability, is somewhere between perfect, or here, one, or not at all. So partial heritability means that tall parents have taller children on average. They're not exactly the same height as their parents. Now, and when we look at behavioral traits, we find, often quite surprisingly, a moderate degree of heritability. About 50% in some cases of our behavior comes from the genetics of our parents. Some surprising heritable traits have to do with personality. So psychologists consider personality to consist of five different dimensions. Agreeableness, like President Reagan, or extroversion, some nutcase like Howard Stern, or somebody who worries a lot, a neurotic like Woody Allen, or a really open person like Dr. Phil, or someone with the extraordinary conscientiousness of Nelson Mandela. All of these have a heritability of between 40 and 60 percent. So all five dimensions of our personalities do have a genetic component. Of course, we are much more complicated than our genes, and our personalities are the result of a unique combination of the genetics we bring into the experiences we have and then modified by our experiences as we grow up. Sexual orientation is also found to have quite a high heritability. It's estimated to be as high as 60% in men and maybe as high as 25% in women. Here are a number of famous homosexual authors and entertainers uh, from the last few centuries. And when people describe their experiences growing up, especially in societies that did not approve of homosexuality, it's like they were born that way. It's something they couldn't really help. So we do recognize, in fact, looking at the genetics, at least patterns of heritability from parents' offspring, that there is a genetic component to this behavior. And this is, again, a human universal. It's not just in Western societies, but all over the world, it seems about 6% of men and about 3% of women are actively gay. So this does give us reason to suspect that sexual orientation does have a genetic component. And in fact, we can look at this in model organisms. One of the best of these is Cenorhabdus elegans. It's a nematode that we'll see throughout this course. It's a very simple ne uh, organism. It has a very simple nervous system. And it turns out that this organism gets around, finds its food, finds mates on the basis of only 383 nerve cells. And only eight of these involve sexual orientation. Worms having sexual orientation? Well, in nematodes, there are two different genders. There are purely male nematodes, and so they only produce sperm. And then there are hermaphrodites. And a hermaphrodite, you may recall, is an individual that can produce both eggs and sperm. And in a wild population of these nematodes, males are really attracted to hermaphrodites. Hermaphrodites would much prefer to mate with males rather than other hermaphrodites. But if you alter just two of these nerve cells in the system of a Cenorhabdus elegans, they'll become exclusively attracted to their own gender. And we can look at sexual orientation by putting odors from male nematodes on this dish and odors from hermaphrodites and let loose real hermaphrodites and, decide, and let them show us which one they would rather associate with. And if you alter these two nerve cells in the Cenorhabdus, the hermaphrodites, instead of showing an attraction for males as they do normally, with these 
genetic alterations that are now attractive only to other hermaphrodites. So homosexuality is something that we see at a fairly low frequency, but we see it everywhere. It's likely to have a genetic basis. And in trying to understand how a trait like this might evolve, we may have to resort to a genetic concept we saw many weeks before called pleiotropy, where one gene affects several different traits. And in this case, it may be that the trait, which is ordinarily advantageous in one sex, alters the sexual orientation in the opposite sex. So there are some data in humans suggesting that there's such a thing as a gay man gene, which may be located on the X chromosome. What this seems to do is to increase the fertility and attractiveness of heterosexual women. So they're really very, very attractive women. But their sons who inherit this attractive trait are more likely to become homosexual. So it's one gene that has two effects, making women more attractive, making them more successful as women, but in a man's body, they're likely to, orient, to alter his orientation. Similarly, there's suggestions of a lesbian gene that some highly masculine men have higher reproductive success because they're so macho, but that gene in their daughters may alter their daughter's sexual orientation so that they become lesbians. Now, religiosity is another trait that is a human universal. We see it in all different societies, whether it's a Muslim society, Christian societies, or in Buddhist society where we have the Dalai Lama. And again, we see a high heritability between parents and offspring. Parents who have a high degree of religiosity tend to have offspring who are also showing a high degree of religiosity. And this seems to be a universal throughout our history. It's seen in ancient cultures of the Aztecs and Teotihuacan, and the Aborigines of Australia, the Druids of Stonehenge, the Incas in Machu Picchu, the ancient Egyptians, Tibet, even back in the earliest art form in the caves of France, early humans from 35,000 years ago messed around with imagery which suggests they too had a symbolic form of looking at spirits and seeing things that were outside normal experience. So religion does seem to be a very deep human universal. When we look at how religiosity may be important in terms of those individuals that possess this trait, there is often a link with reproduction. So, for example, you may be familiar with a reality television show set in Arkansas where Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar have 19 children and they're constantly trying to have more. All their kids stay at home and they're a deeply religious family. And the mother famously likes to quote Psalm 127, which says, Lo, children are heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. And the Duggars firmly believe that each child is a special gift from God. So their religion motivates them to have lots and lots of children. And again, in American history, we've seen examples of new religions forming out in the western part of the U.S. are the Mormons, and they're often well known for their polygynous practices. And some of the founding figures of Mormonism had dozens of wives and dozens of children. Religious feelings can be very fundamental to the way we view the world. And yet, some people are far more religious than others. Some people just don't find that very appealing, whereas others get completely swept away in religious feeling. So it's likely, and in fact there's evidence, that there's a neurological basis for this contrast between different people. These graphs show an interesting relationship between how willing people are to accept supernatural explanations for phenomenon, like there is some unexpected event has happened, oh, it's a miracle, or, well, no, actually, that unexpected event was because I just forgot that something was going to happen. So you're either rather skeptical about the world and you want to know X, Y, and Z, but some people sort of take it on faith that there's some source out there that's going to make things better. So those that accept those supernatural explanations is associated with different levels of serotonin receptors in the brain. So along the x-axis, in these two graphs, this one shows for the brain stem and this for the hippocampus, is the number of serotonin receptors. And those individuals who are more likely to have these religious feelings about unexpected events have relatively few serotonin receptors 
Whereas more skeptical people have a lot more serotonin receptors. They just see the world in a different way and they feel differently when they see the same events. And we can also see signs of a neurological difference that correlates with religious feelings if we look at patients, people who have epilepsy. Epilepsy often involves having fits and seizures, but at the ends of these seizures, some people come out of that state with a sense like they'd experienced some afterlife experience or they'd seen God or something like that. And so epileptic patients that frequently experience religious ecstasy as they come out of their, their epileptic state, it turns out that their brains are again different from those that don't. And so those with highly uh, religious-based uh, sensations during their seizures tend to have a smaller right hippocampus than those that do not. So we have a neurological basis for differences between these two kinds of people. Now, if there is a biological basis for religiosity, what are the selective advantages? What could have led natural selection to favor those individuals who are capable of these kinds of feelings? Well, psychologists have found that high levels of religiosity significantly reduce the risks of depression in adolescent girls. And in probing on this, they find that these girls have a greater sense of connectedness. They, they feel less isolated in society. For men, a high degree of religiosity significantly increases their cooperativeness. This is true in both sexes, but it's much stronger in men than it is in women. So those men who, again, have these religious feelings are far more cooperative than those that don't. And this is typified by this. This is a, a Quaker ceremony where all the men in the community come together and they raise a, a roof for a member of their community. So they all work together within their religious community. So often these kinds of feelings of wanting to do something for everybody else is because you have a strong sense of group identity. You feel a connectedness outside your own single solitary problems because you're part of something bigger than yourself. So, what I wanted to demonstrate is that some fairly complex human behaviors are influenced by genetics. We see heritability in the personality traits, religious orientation, sexual orientation. And we also see that any number of these traits are likely to affect our survival and our reproduction.